Greetings from Seven Springs Studio in far northern Adair County, Cherokee country in Oklahoma. My name is Bobby C. Martin. I'm a citizen of the Muscogee Creek Tribe in Oklahoma. And we're here in my studio today uh, to talk about family. Uh, I thank uh, Museum of Native American History for, for inviting me to do this and um, thank you for joining. Um, so what I'd like to do, I've, I've been working with this idea of family and family photos and family history for nearly 30 years now and still I'm not grown tired of it. So what I'd, I would like to do today is to share some of my work with you and how I use those, those family memories in the form of photos and other uh, material and then show you some ways that you could take these same, these same ideas, same images, same family mementos and turn them into, hopefully, uh, art that you can treasure. Well, as I mentioned, uh, I've worked with family, the idea of family, the idea of family memory, family heritage, family just honoring the idea of, of connectedness to our past. Um, I've been trained, I was trained uh, as a printmaker and a draftsman. I got uh, an undergraduate degree at Northeastern State University in Tahlequah many, many years ago, and then got my MFA at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. Um, and all through that process, still trying to figure out what I was going to do with art. And somewhere along the way, I stumbled upon an old box full of family photos. And initially started just copying the photos because I thought they were just amazing pieces of, of art in their own right. And thankfully, I had a lot of photographers in the family, a lot of aunts and my mom and other family members that took a lot of pictures and I have been the beneficiary of all that. So I just want to show you a few things that reflect that. Um, this kind of started it all. This is, this is a, a, a picture of the uh, actual painting. This is a painting that's in the Gilcrease Museum um, that kind of started this idea of using old family uh, photos. This is a, a great aunt and uncle, Ola May and Uncle Frank. And one thing that has always interested me, not, not only in the, the images themselves, but the other information, there's all, all these layers of, of family history. For our family, as a Native American family, on my mom's side, this idea of, of allotment land, of, of families that got a certain amount of, of acreage because they were, in our case, Creek Indians. Um, it was a way for the government, the federal government, to disperse all native lands in order to open the remaining land up to white settlement. And so each na native person, whether they were an infant or whether they were uh, you know, aged, all got a certain amount of land. So my granny's name was Mabel Carr. You'll see her, her image later. But she had, they were all assigned a certain uh, enrollment number. And even today, as a native, as a citizen of the Muscogee tribe, I have to re reference that number. In fact, I've got a little ID card in my wallet that I, have to, I don't have to carry, but I carry it in order to be able to qualify for a lot of these programs and other benefits of the tribe. And so that's, a, that's an identity. That's one layer of identity. You know, we have, to me, the identity is the real identity of, of our family. And for me, it's, it's the people. It's always the people. But there are always these multiple layers of identity that are involved. And in this case, I don't know if you can see it with the, uh, the, the, the light, but I've got, as a printmaker, I like to combine lots of different uh, elements. In this case, I combined a, a, a photo itself with um, some, in this case, some uh, scripture from Proverbs that talk about a godly wife. And so this was, uh, this was, a relative and two of my first cousins, um, but I also embedded a lot of words in the background for that. Some of my most recent uh, pieces that I've been working on have to do uh, with works from a from a show, a, a three-person show that my friends Tony Tiger and Aaron Shaw have been uh, collaborating with me on. It's called Altars of Reconciliation. And it's actually about the, the journeys, the stories of, of us as Native Americans and also as practicing Christians. And that's a, that's a whole other uh, story 
that is a thread that's, that's common among many, many native peoples is this, this idea of uh, why are you worshiping the, the religion of the, of the invaders? <laughs> um, there's a lot of, of tension in those, those kind of ideas. And so our idea was to try and uh, explore those, those uh, sorts of tensions and, and, and things that, that happen and that's happened in our lives. And part of that has to do, again, comes back to the family. This is me in the middle of all these amazing women. My mom here, my granny here, my brother sneaking up behind here, um, and all my aunts. And to me, it's, uh, it's this idea of being surrounded by all these amazing, strong women. These women that have both physically and spiritually supported me, whether I knew it or not. And I, I, this picture is a perfect sort of physical embodiment of that where I'm literally standing in the middle of all these amazing women while they're they're doing their thing and so I love that and so what I've tried to do is is take these family images and use them in ways that that um, that bring honor to the people that were in them also this, they're just for me they're memories that I want to cherish and the interesting thing about that is the fact that the more I've shown these I've, I've used these family photos for you know, nearly 30 years now. And it's, I've found that, yes, they're my family, but the more I show them in the public and more people see them and uh, I, we talk about them, that it's, 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 there's a universal, universality to these images. People see themselves in my family, which I'm very thankful for. And that's probably one reason why I keep using these images because they are so, um, so universal. I mean, everybody can see themselves and their family in these images. And so that's been very gratifying for me as an artist. So also, um, and this will play into a little bit of the demo workshops uh, later in the video, uh, I've been uh, strangely sort of fixated on maps lately. And so I wanna show you a couple of, of, of ways that maps uh, make their way into my art. This one is sort of a layered um, map uh, piece. Uh, we've got the green area, which is actually, I'll, I'll show you another piece that actually might make sense of this. These are both related pieces, both in a lot of ways collaborations with my late mother. She actually took the photo of this couple uh, when she was going to a, a technical school in Lawrence, Kansas called Haskell. Institute, and now it's called uh, Indian Nations University, a uh, four-year college now for Native uh, students. She took the picture of the homecoming king and queen, which I thought was very interesting. Um, and so I used her photo, but then layered uh, multiple other bits of information. Maps have always been, I've always been fascinated with maps. Maps are like uh, the original infographic. I mean, they're, they're works of art, but they're also pieces of information, and they're also essential ways that, that you were able to navigate the world. And so there's all these multiple layers in maps. But for me as an artist and a, and a designer, just the, the quality of the way maps look. In this case, because she took the photo in Kansas, I wanted to relate it to the location. I've always, I'm always really kind of thinking about place. Place, home, location. In this case, I got a couple of maps. One came out of a, an old Rand McNally 50s road map, which is the blue. The blue part is just a, a 50s road map of Kansas, of the state of Kansas. And then the red is, um, you might, I don't know if you can see the title, called Immigrant Indians. This is an 1830s era map showing part of Oklahoma, Kansas, and up into Nebraska, and where these tri the tribal peoples that had come even from farther uh, northeast of here were moved, forced, relocated down in this area. Um, so it's two, two layers of time, two layers of information. The most interesting thing I thought about it was the fact that it's titled Immigrant Indians, you know, in the, you know, sort of inferring that these folks had a choice in the matter. Um, and so this, this idea of layering and then on top of all the layers of information, people, actual real people, real memories, real family. And so that's something that's, that's attracted me for many years. And I, I hope as I show you some of the things that I, um, that I do and have, that, you, that you could do at home, 
that that will be something that you can think about, you know, this idea of family, this idea of connection to your past. Also, I wanted to, uh, again, another, another map uh, obsession. <laughs> this is a, a little map uh, of, our, of the area in uh, southeastern Oklahoma where my family actually had their allotted land. Um, Mabel Carr is over here in this corner, her sister Addie. Um, this is actually a plat from right around Oklahoma statehood that showed where all these, these plots of land are located. Um, and then I overlaid it, in this case, I overlaid it as, as a printmaker. That's most of how I create my images. I cut a little uh, linoleum uh, plate uh, to create, um, in this case, let me hang on just a second, I'll show you. I've got Clyde here. Clyde, the big red Indian. He's not very big not right here, but as an artist I can make him as big as I want. And so what Clyde has become is kind of my Seven Springs Studios mascot. Um, found this at my mom's house. I guess it was my brother and I played with it at some point back in the day. Um, so I made a, uh, a repeatable image of Clyde that I could in then imprint over in multiple places. In this case, I, I imprinted Clyde over the top of, I actually uh, letterpress, handset some letterpress type um, and created a, a reconstruction of a little hymn book that my grandmother, my granny had um, and then overlaid Clyde on the top of that. So it's, to me, it's again, it's, layer, it's layering all kinds of information, whether it's maps, whether it's words, and then pulling it all together with, with human beings, you know, with, with, the, with, the, with the memory and, the, and the, just the, re the realness of, of people, especially family members. So this, you've seen a little bit of my other work. This is a piece that I kind of, feel is kind of a summary of, of a lot of the, the, the way I make art, which is that connection with family, connection with family history, connection with, with political history. It's really identity. It's, it's in some ways, it's just a giant self-portrait. The title of it is called, But You Don't Look Indian. Um, I did this piece for a solo show a couple of years ago. Um, and the title of the show was also, But You Don't Look Indian, because I, I hear that a lot in a lot of uh, some of the art shows that I go to, uh, sometimes somebody will come in and they have certain stereotype, stereotype thoughts about what natives should look like or even the kind of art they should be doing. Um, and I hear that still, still today, even occasionally, but you don't look Indian. Um, so it makes me think, well, what am I supposed to look like? I'm not sure. But to me, this is the history of me as a Native American person. This is my mother. Um, and throughout this whole um, big layer cake of imagery are other images of my children, my uh, parents and their parents. There's also a map of Oklahoma mixed in with all this. The process that I'm using here is encaustic, which I will show how that's done here in a little bit, but I just wanted to show you how important this process is to the way I make art, which is um, being able to mix all this, all this stew of material into a, a single unified piece using this, this material of wax. Um, you can see with the, here we've got some raised areas of wax with the, with the uh, Dawes Roll enrollment names. This Mabel Carr here was my grandmother, this my mom's mom. Um, there's an old Oklahoma license plate. I grew up in Oklahoma, and they, uh, as forever to me, is Indian country, and that's what most people refer to Oklahoma still today as Indian country. Um, also, uh, there's a couple of little, I don't know if you can see them here, these little protrusions, which are teeth, my son's teeth. Um, there's been, you know, over the last few years especially, a lot of this questioning, who is Indian, who can claim to be Indian, uh, can you take a DNA test, which you can't, by the way, to tell what tribe you are. But anyway, I thought, well, if we're going to have this DNA question, I'm just going to put some actual DNA in the painting. And that's what, these are my son's teeth, so if anybody wants to, to test DNA, they can just go right to the painting. Uh, but otherwise, there's this, it's, again, it's just an amazing 
to me, an amazing uh, history that my family has had, and I want to celebrate that history. And I hope as you're trying to uh, formulate your own ideas that you think about your history, think about the stories that are contained in your family's history. Not, on, not only the people, but their stories, their, their, their uh, personal histories and what made them who they are and ultimately contributed to what made you who you are. One last thing I wanted to point out down here uh, on my mom's necklace, um, the original photograph, she had these little um, like seashell uh, necklace. And as I was trying to decide, okay, should I paint that in? My wife pointed out, well, those, these, little, these little doilies that your grandmother made, they already look kind of like seashells. And so I thought, hmm, okay. So we cut those out and actually with the, with the encaustic wax, we applied the doilies that my grandmother made onto the painting to be, and again, uh, just a, an integral part. So it's really, a, it's not just me working on this. It's a, it's a family collaboration um, that really f uh, tells a story for me personally, but I hope it also tells, uh, it, it speaks to other people and makes them reflect and think about their own stories, their own family history. Okay, well you've seen some of the ways that I uh, incorporate family and heritage and, and memory and history into my artwork. I'd like to um, give you the opportunity as the viewer to, to do that yourself. Um, Hopefully, you know, you, if, as you think through family, whether it's, you know, distant family, close relatives, uh, you know, whether your family is, is, uh, has a lot of, of imagery or not, is, is not important so much as just going through the, 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 the process of, uh, of gathering the materials. And that's where I wanted to start with, with the hands-on part of this. Um, I'm sort of a pack rat when it comes to to collecting things like that. In fact, I've kind of as the as I've become the family keeper of old things. <laughs> all my all my family, all my cousins, and everybody know that now. And every time we get together, they'll show up with more photos that I haven't seen before. Um, and then also just other other little mementos. Uh, those are somehow those are important connectors to our to our past. And so I wanted to show a few things. And what I what I want to show is. It's very simple. The process is very simple. It's basically a cut and paste collage type of process. What's different about it though, and I want to show you kind of how I operate on this, is the, is the things you want to collage. You know, it's all about the materials you use. So I just want to show you a few things that I think you might find interesting. And I'll, I'll put, a, put a little bit of this together for you. So what I start with, I have a big pile of, of stuff. And a lot of it is because as, as an artist and a printmaker, I end up with a lot of prints that don't make the grade, that are not quite uh, ready for prime time, but they make wonderful collage elements. And so I've got this little map that's printed on this, this really cool um, Japanese uh, paper. In fact, um, paper is a big deal, especially to a printmaker. Um, you can find a lot of these really exotic papers, um, even in places like Hobby Lobby, we'll have a lot of these. Now, this is a great little mulberry paper. Um, some of these other papers, this, is, this one's wild looking. It's got all kinds of, of uh, little pieces of fiber in it. They make great collage elements because you can glue them down, you can glue other things on top of them. You can glue, because they're sort of transparent, you can glue things behind them and show them through, and I'll, I'll, I'll do some of that and you'll be able to see that here in a bit. So papers are important. For me, the ba uh, any kind of, you need, need some kind of a solid base. In this case, I've just got a piece of uh, mat board that is gonna be my base. You could use foam core or anything that's got, you know, a, a stiff piece of cardboard would be great. Anything that gives you a kind of a nice solid base to start with because you're gonna be ending up applying you know, multiple things on top of that. So I've got some papers that I use. I've also, you're uh, being able to scan or take photos of your old, your old photos are gonna be uh, important and then print them out on a little inkjet printer. That's what I've got here. This is an actual little blow up of a page from my granny's um, hymn book. Um, so I like to just incorporate not just photos of people, but also the things that were important to those people. Um, I've, I've used and, and done other 
kind of commissions where we've used like old love letters from you know mom to dad or, or other or, or newspaper clippings things like that um, that that really have bring bring extra meaning uh, to these kind of projects this is one this is interesting uh, it's a Muscogee a language uh, New Testament uh, one of the things that uh, helped mis my tribe's language survive was the fact that the Bible was translated into our language and in, in large part that helped that language survive when all this upheaval happened uh, of, of forced removal and all the things that that's that all the upheaval that happened in those days um, this plain old you know Xerox copies or inkjet prints make wonderful source material this is my mom and her her friend uh, so I've got a whole stack of photos here that are going to be and again what I do is I just get it all together put it in a big pile and then kind of use it as my my well to draw from when I start putting this all together other things you know you could think about uh, I don't even know why I have this but a little ledger page uh, makes good little background uh, uh, information what else do I have in my stack here uh, one thing I'm going to start with and I'll, I'll get that in a second things old old road atlases old Rand McNally road atlases uh, again that's my personal obsession with maps but uh, it's interesting uh, material and I'm going to start with this on mine also, uh, you might think about if you have these available and you're willing to uh, permanently give them up <laughs> in a piece of art, is any kind of uh, fabric or, in this case, I've got some little, little doilies that were similar to the one I showed you earlier in the big painting that um, were made by my grandmother. Uh, hundreds of these. Um, she's, that, was, that was her... Uh, her hobby was to sit around and make all these these little doilies. So I have a lot of these. I have this. This is just some fabric that makes a great uh, little design element. And so a lot of this is just trying to gather up a, a nice supply of, of things that you can put down on your uh, on your collage that is meaningful to you. And is meaningful to you and your family. Uh, that helps you to then make that. That connection, you know, you've got a visual connection, brings back those memories, and there's just something really important and powerful about that. Okay, as I mentioned, Miss Rand McNally is like this. Unfortunately, in this one, I've already kind of trashed all the Oklahoma maps, <laughs> so I think I'll pick a different state. And this could, this is this is just me personally, but I'm gonna let's see. I'm going to go, if I haven't used it already, I'm going to go to Alabama. And the reason, oh, it's spread across two pages. Okay. Well, I'm going to use the northern half of Alabama. Reason being, my, uh, the original ancestral homelands for the Muscogee Creek people are Alabama and Georgia. So for me, it does have a, a meaning. Uh, to me, as an artist, I really like to... I mean, to me, it, it, it all should have meaning to me as an artist. Hopefully it resonates with other people. Sometimes, though, you know, if you just want to use a pure design element, that's cool, too. Uh, but I'm going to start with the map, the Rand McNally map of Alabama here. Pull that out of here. And I've got my little uh, base plate of map board. And we have a few little tools of the trade here that are going to be important for us. First of all, you already saw it used here, a little, little bit of utility knife, a couple of X-Acto knives. You can't go do any kind of collage, cut and paste project without something to cut with. So X-Acto knives are good. Just be careful. Keep a sharp blade. Dull blades are not your friend. So just be careful. Don't, uh, don't cut. As I teach printmaking, um, when using sharp blades, you know, I always tell my students, don't, you know, keep your fingers out of the way, right? Scissors. Of course, got to have that. In this case, I'm going to be mostly using the magic ingredient here, Mod Podge. <laughs> Any kind of adhesive will work, though. Mod Podge I like a lot because it, it goes on smooth. It doesn't kind of bubble up. And, uh, you know, white Elmer's glue is nice, but it's, uh, this, this is just a little bit better quality. Um, 
Glue stick is okay, especially if you want to put just a little small bits on. That'll help hold, but uh, I'm, I'm a Mod Podge guy, so I, <laughs> I wish I could get some kind of a sponsorship because I go through a lot of this stuff. Um, and also, you need a brush or two to be able to brush your adhesive, your Mod Podge on. And I've got, I mean, anything you've got laying around that you think would make marks or that you want to attach would be good. I've got some little stamps. I've even got, because I've got uh, access to it at, at the university, at John Brown University where I teach, I've even got some of these little pieces of lead type that I could stick in some paint and stick on there and make some little random marks on it if I want to. It's really just, the whole, this whole exercise is just for you to, to let your creativity go and, and uh, make something that, that really feels a part of you and meaningful to you. So first thing I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and put the map as my background. And I'm going to trim a little bit of this off. I'm really unblessed. I've got this nice studio space. I've got this work table. This work table has glass on the top, so I can roll out ink when I do my printing. So I've got a little etching press back here. But it also is great for when I want to cut stuff. I don't have to worry about messing up my kitchen table or anything like that. So I'm going to cut that off. And this is this little northern part of Alabama is going to be my my background. So let me attach that. And I'm just going to brush it on. I'm going to pour a little bit on. And I've got I've got a other thing that's handy if you really do you get into this much um, are these these little rollers that are used to roll out ink for printmaking, but they they work great for rolling out um, adhesive as well. But if, I'm going to use a brush in this case. In this case, I'm going to use these are just little cheapy um, throwaway brushes that I got at Lowe's. You can get them at, at, at Walmart too. They're about a dollar, two dollars each. Um, because Mod Podge is a great uh, material, but it doesn't wash out of brushes all that great. So I just I tend to just Use them, use them until they don't work anymore and then just toss them. So, so I'm just going to spread out a real thin layer of Mod Podge. And again, any other kind of white glue is good. The thing about Mod Podge, especially if, you, if you're in this in any kind of professional setting, um, Mod Podge is a kind of glue that's called a PV, PVA glue. I think I got that right. PVA glue, that means it is um, archival. So any kind of white glue, even the, even the Elm, oh my goodness, any of the Elmers, <laughs> if you get that too much, just get your handy uh, brush and get, get it back in the jar. Don't waste any of that Mod Podge. But the, um, this white glue is archival, which means it's not going to yellow or uh, or cause damage to any of the the work that you're adhering, and that's important, um, especially if you if you are doing this as as an artist that wants to be able to show their work or you know or sell your work or whatever. Um, so that's that's what I one of the things I really like about this white PVA glue that it is um, an archival uh, material. All right, so I'm. My map of Alabama here, make sure I don't put it on backwards. And I'm just going to set it on, start at one corner. Don't just drop it down on there because you'll probably get wrinkles and stuff in it. But I'm going to just start at one corner and try and lay it down and get it nice and even. And this is actually where these little guys come in handy because you can just roll over the top. You don't have to have one of these, but it sure makes it easy to get a nice smooth uh, surface to roll it out on. Get a little bit more glue here. Make sure that sits down. Okay. So at this point, I have my, my base of a map, and this is going to be where I kind of start from here. And this is, everybody's creative in different ways, but to me, what I, when I think about 
a starting point, I start looking at the different elements uh, and how they they might play into anything else I put over the top of that. So, or you can just use it as a as a. One thing I love about maps, you could use this as just a texture. You know, it's, it doesn't have to be red as a map. It just creates this really interesting kind of a surface texture. So lots of lots of things. You don't have to use a map, but that's just that's that's my thing. <laughs> All right, so I have my uh, base uh, surface I want to work with. By the way, I did cut this. It's a um, 11 by 14. I, I wanted to make it uh, sort of a standard frame size, so hopefully it, when we're done, it's, it's worthy enough to, to want to put in a frame and, and uh, give away or put on your wall. So I have, put, I have cut this to a, a standard frame size. I've got a, like I showed you earlier, I've got a whole collection of different Imagery. I'm gonna. I'm gonna use. I'm gonna start with this picture. This picture of my mom when she looks like she's maybe 16 or 17 years old. People really liked posing in front of their vehicles back in the day. I mean, it was a it was a proud moment <laughs> to be able to take a picture in front of your car. Um, the one thing that uh, I am gonna do. I don't. I don't want to use the whole picture. I just want to use part of the picture. So I'm going to cut a little bit of this out. In this case, I'm just gonna use just a plain old pair of scissors. You can cut all this out. So as you're thinking about what to use, again, things that are meaningful to you, things that are meaningful to your family. Um, hopefully it's a good excuse to, to dig through the old photo albums and to try and just remember what um, some of these folks were like. My mother just passed away earlier this year, so it's important to me to kind of rem have her memory kept alive. Um, have her still a part of my life, even though she's she's gone on. So what I've what I've done is cut it, cut it out. Uh, I'm going to try and find a, a good spot to uh, attach it here. And I think I'm going to put her over here in the lower left corner. This is you know these are these are your artist artistic decisions that you want to make as the artist. Um, I'm doing this one piece at a time, but what I'm going to do is kind of get them before I glue this down. Actually, I should put Mod Podge away. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I do want to cut multiple pieces out because I've got other. I've got, got more modern pictures. This is my daughter, who in a lot of a lot of these photographs looks just like my mom at that age. So I want to, you know, those are the kind of connections that you sort of you will start to see, and that's I think that's one of the important things of a project like this of connecting to family. Suddenly, you see. Um, likenesses, or you see, or you th or you remember. Uh, oh well, my granny did did this. That's just like my daughter does. You know things like that. I think those are those are important memories, and I think this helps to to retain those memories. So what I want to do is, I'm not going to attach anything yet. I want to cut out some material, cut out some different. I've got a whole stack of goodies here. I've also I would like to be able to use this this kind of this lacy material somewhere. I don't know where just yet. So what I want to do, I might even I might even throw a piece, some of this crazy mulberry paper that I was showing you earlier. That might be a good little um, a good little piece that goes in here at some point, and maybe even put a photo piece, maybe a little row of photos over that. So I'm just thinking through this right now as I've got all this material here, and that's that's what I'd suggest you could do too. Is just you know get your get your base, get your starting point, and then just gather all this material together. Start arranging it before you glue anything, start arranging it, how you feel like it might work together. And think about story too. Think about how you would tell a story with this, with this image, with this piece of art. Uh, it doesn't have to be in order, you know, people you think of comic books or what in sequence of, of, of frames or, or, uh, or uh, just a, a sequential story, but it doesn't have to be that. It could just be a group of images that mean something to you and hopefully to your other family members. So. 
as you put all this together, just get your get all your your, your raw material there and play around with it, move it around, see what see where it looks like it would work. Then you can start breaking out good old Mod Podge and start attaching everything together. And don't be afraid, you know, one of the things uh, that people uh, feel afraid of sometimes is just, just, just the act of making something. I mean, this to me is just give yourself permission to just start cutting and pasting and making. And I think you'll find it's, especially when you're, when you're working with people that have, uh, are close and near and dear to your heart, um, it'll, it'll, it'll be a, a, an exercise that just kind of, uh, I think it's therapeutic and is just really um, something that can, can be, uh, it's of real value. Here's our final result of the finished collage. So now I want to get into a little more advanced um, collaging, and this is what this is. It's more uh, serious, serious advanced collage, and it's going to. Uh, the reason I want to show you is, as we saw that large painting earlier uh, with encaustic, and that's what the name of this material is called, encaustic wax. It's actually a beeswax material mixed in with a Damar resin to help um, harden the wax. Um, that it's, it's a great, it's a wonderful art making material. And it's gotten really popular over the last oh, seven, eight, ten 10 years uh, as, a, as an art making process. It's an ancient process. It goes back to the Egyptian times when they used wax, they used pigments and colors embedded in the wax to paint these uh, portraits of faces that would then go over the sarcophagi, the sarcophagus of a, of a of a person who had passed away in ancient Egypt, they would paint these lifelike portraits out of encaustic wax. And if you see some in museums today, they still look as fresh 2,000 years later, 2,000 plus years later, as they did when they're painted because <clears throat> the, the pigment is embedded in that wax. And, and uh, if you take care of the wax, that, that pigment and that color is gonna look as fresh as it did when it was painted. So what I'm gonna do is I wanna show you because I'm kind of referencing the big painting that we looked at earlier and how I use this encaustic process. It's, a, it's not something that you can go to Hobby Lobby and buy, but it's readily available at any online art supply store like Dick Blick or Jerry's Artorama, places like that. Um, you can buy the materials for it. You can buy um, all the tools that you need. You can even, they'll even sell you hot plates for it. Although if you can see here, I don't have a fancy hot plate. I've just got a Walmart griddle, which works just as well. Uh, it does involve hot wax. You're actually melting the wax to its liquid state and then using it to apply to your art piece. So I'll show you a little bit of what we've got here. It, the, this brand I'm using is called RNF Encaustic Medium. Um, it's actually, when it says medium, it's kind of like uh, in painting, they have uh, different mediums, acrylic mediums, that are basically just unpigmented uh, binders. And that's what this is. You just This is just the wax and the, and the Damar resin. Uh, they also make the same material in, in can form and also in tubes. So this is a this is interesting product here. It's made in Spain and it's again available at some art supply stores, but mostly online. It's um, a water soluble encaustic. It's still wax. The the, the color is, is is uses wax as a binder, but the but the the pigment is actually you can put it on like a watercolor and make and thin it out. It's really interesting material. So those are the uh, the basic uh, actual materials you're making. Uh, I also um, use uh, the surfaces I put them on. Um, <clears throat> usually have to be very flat. You wouldn't want to put this on a, like a stretch canvas. Canvas has too much flex to it. So you'd want something that's got a, a really uh, hard surface. In this case, I've just used, this is actually a, a purchased one. It's a, called Encausta Board. It's made um, for encaustic, but you could use masonite or anything. This is this is a piece I'll be working on in a few minutes where I'll just cut a piece of masonite and use it as a support. Um, because it does need, the encaustic does need a very uh, firm and, and uh, non-flexing surface. Um, so what I wanted to show you real quick is how this process works. I've got my wax melted here. It, it melts at about 175 degrees, uh, which is not hot enough to cause any serious burns, but it it, it's hot, so you got to be careful. Um, I'm also using 
these little bamboo brushes to apply the wax. Um, in some of these cases though, instead of, I'm just gonna actually, nice thing I like about this griddle, you can, you can dip things directly in to the wax and then put it on, on your working surface. So let me move this out of the way. Okay, so now what we want to do is kind of show you how this process works. And, and again, it works the same whether I'm working very, uh, on a small board like this or a large uh, surface. Um, so what I'm going to use, uh, this is a piece that's partly, uh, partly completed. You can see it's got uh, some, some work already on it. This is a, a photograph on, that I printed off on some really interesting Japanese paper. Also, there's a, there's a drawing, of the actual drawing that's been uh, drawn into the wax. And then this other interesting texture that I've created with this uh, different kind of Japanese paper. Uh, what's really interesting and what attracted me to this idea of um, encaustic and wax is the layering uh, process of it. Uh, I, for years, I'd, I was a digital artist, worked with programs like mostly Photoshop and use their, their, the, the layers uh, menu and was able to take multiple different images and words and layer them on top of each other. And I loved doing that, but it was hard to find a, a physical counterpart to that. I, just, I, I looked and tried and do different things and I just couldn't find anything that actually made sense to layer where you could still see, you could layer things and you could still see through those layers to all the layers below. And that's where I stumbled on encaustic. And that's when I stumbled on the, the fact that you could layer things and there's still some transparency or translucency that you can see through those layers to the layers below it. And suddenly, you know, it was one of those, you know, mind blown kind of experiences like, wow, this is like Photoshop in real life <laughs> for me. Um, and that's where a lot of this comes in where you can see where this, this, uh, this piece, little piece of paper here this, this drawing is actually underneath that piece of paper, but it looks, it looks totally transparent. And so the, that transparency, and plus, there's, this is me personally, there's something about, this wax already has sort of a, kind of a yellowish color anyway, because it's beeswax, and it automatically adds, and you can kind of see that yellow cast here, it, it adds an immediate sense of, of, of age. Uh, and there's something that really attracts me to that idea of, of every layer I put down adds more and more age, more years, more wear, you know, wear and tear. Um, so that's something, all those things kind of came together for me probably seven or eight years ago uh, to make me really uh, kind of fall in love with this process. So I just want to really want to briefly show you how this actually works. In this case, what I want to do is I want to add, I want to add a few words here. This is from uh, Muskogee scripture from the Bible here. This is the, it's not coyote, it's actually Kanya Coyote, which is the book of John, the gospel of John. So I want to, I want to apply these words over the top of this texture. And then I also, then on top of that, I want to apply this little photograph of my, my grandpa on my dad's side. And then my dad, uh, doing a little team tag team mowing out in the schoolyard. And I just want to show you how this works so you can see that transparency and the way that this process works. So what I want to do is cut, cut this little bit in half here. And I've got my hot wax here. What I want to do is actually, I'm going to um, just dip this right into the wax, trying not to burn myself. And and I'm going to place that on. And you got to work fast because it is, it is hot wax. So, and I'll show you how that looks. So that is on there like that. You can, the, the cool thing, uh, there's so many cool things, I can't list them all, but one of the cool things about uh, this hot wax, you can see it's starting to cool now, but as soon as as soon as it starts cooling and uh, and is ultimately cooled, you can then you know go back in and draw into it, scrape into it, scrape it off if you don't like that. Just scrape it off and start over. It's very forgiving and it's very um, malleable. In other words, I can 
I can keep adding more wax over the top of this and create all these cool textures. And hopefully, um, if you get a chance to experiment with this too, you can not only use the colors of encaustic, but you can use encaustic to create these amazing textures. So let me, I'm going to put this other little bit of drawing material over here with a nice coating of hot wax. And so what I want to do, ultimately, I'm going to get this, let this cool off a bit. Then overlay this. And if it works right, hopefully, this is, again, one of those more, more cool things about encaustic. Any paper, but especially these really thin papers, like this Japanese type paper, any thin paper, tracing paper, any kind of thin paper that you can print on an inkjet printer, the paper, once you soak it in the encaustic, will will disappear. It, it won't go away, it just turns it transparent. So then all that's left is your image. It looks like your image is just floating uh, on that surface. And you'll see that in just a second. So let me let me cool this down just a bit and then there's one, one step that has to happen before I put anything else on top. Okay, we've attached or we've embedded the, um, the words here that I want to over overlay another image on top of that. One thing we have to do before you do that, though, um, is, a, is a process called fusing. Uh, with encaustic, what happens is each time you put a layer of wax down, you have to partially melt that wax in order for it to bond with the wax that's below it. If you don't, what could happen is those different layers of wax could pop off from each other because they're not, they're, not, um, they're not sticking to each other. So this is where my little uh, heat gun comes in, although this is not a little one. This is a big one. So if the light's all... If everything goes black, you know what happened. I'm going to turn this on. We'll see. But what, what I'm doing here is taking this heat gun and just lightly melting the, the wax that I just applied in order for it to bond to the wax that's already there. So let's see what happens. What you're looking for is the wax that has barely changed color. Right there. It's changing right there. So that's, that's what's supposed to happen. Now, if you want to get really uh, crazy with it, and some people do this, they just melt the wax completely until it's runny, and then just move the wax around and create interesting effects that way, where you're just actually sort of painting with the wax, with the heat gun. Um, I, I, I'm not quite that crazy with it, but it's, it's, a, it's another way of using encaustic. Encaustic is such a versatile medium that it, there's so many different ways to use it and different effects that you can get with it. So what I've got, I've got these bonded uh, together. They're nice and uh, fused onto the surface here. At this point, what I could do if I wanted to, uh, what some people do is they'll, they will, they will uh, take uh, like a, a razor blade or some kind of a scraping tool and then and just scrape that back to sort more of a level a surface. I'm going to do that just a little bit to kind of make my next layer fit a little bit better. So I'm just going to scrape that. Any leftover wax I just throw back in the, in the griddle there. So again, I'm just trying to kind of even it out, kind of give it a nice level surface in order to apply the next layer. So, And again, this is another creative thing. Some people will really use the scraping or the scratching to create uh, even additional textures or additional sort of designs. So let me scrape just a bit more here. All right. So that's, these are in now part of this piece. They're embedded into that, that, that layer cake that we're creating. And now what I want to do is so I've got a little, this little image I showed you earlier. I want to be able to just overlay that on top of the words. And this, this is a little bit too big. I'm not quite brave enough to dip that in. I could if I was willing to risk my fingers to get a little hot. Like I said, it's not hot enough to really burn, but it's not comfortable either. So I'm not going to do it. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to take one of my uh, brushes here and just brush over the top of it. So I'm going to lay that where I want it, lay that in place, and then take the work over here. And I'll go ahead and use the small brush for this. 
and then just apply a nice layer of wax over the top of this. And one thing you're going to see that I love about encaustic is the way that suddenly the paper support pretty much just disappears and the, the words that are underneath show through. And so again, it's that, that idea of layering. You, you, the things you put on top of the other things tend to want to show through depending on the kind of paper you're using or what other kind of support you're using. You could again, just like we were looking at with the, um, the collage, you could, if you wanted to, like I did with a big painting, you could embed uh, fabric, you know, thin fabric of any kind or lace or, or any, in really any kind of dimensional object can easily be embedded in this material, which is really cool because then you can, uh, you can build up textures around it or you can, you can add things to it. And in fact, I have friends that work with encaustic and they actually create kind of sculptural um, extensions from the, from their flat surface of their, of their work. They'll, they'll, they'll build up encaustic to a point where it's really coming, coming out at you which is interesting. So this is what I have so far. What I'll do, I'm gonna, uh, this, my next step would then be to go ahead and fuse this, what I just added. So each time we add something new, we have to fuse it to, in order for that wax to bond to the to previous wax. Um, but that's, that's the, the quick way of the way I use encaustic. There's, again, there's multiple ways to do this, but it's a really fun and unique uh, art process and art material. Um, that's uh, it's easily available and it's it's really easy to use and it's easy and it's fun to experiment with so I just wanted to show you how that that process works and here is our final encaustic piece thanks for joining me today at Seven Springs studio I also want to thank the Museum of Native American History for the opportunity and I hope some of these ideas uh, today have inspired you to Create your own family-themed artwork.